Was that our cue? <laughs> Greetings, Team Endurance. Four o'clock on day four of the OpenStack Summit, and you guys are still here. <laughs> or you fell asleep in your seats from the last session, and nobody came and poked you. I'm not sure which. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. We have a little bit of a play on you can have your cake and eat it too. Uh, my colleague and I are going to talk about how you can build your OpenStack and consume it too. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Valentina Laria, and I work for PlumGrid. PlumGrid is a software-defined company that has a solution for OpenStack, and I work on the product management, product marketing side of the house. Uh, my name is Brian Thompson. I lead product management for Rackspace's OpenStack private cloud portfolio, um, where we've partnered with PlumGrid as well for more advanced SDN capabilities within our private clouds. So one of the interesting challenges that we have that kind of sets the stage for this is really those barriers to adoption for enterprises, customers of OpenStack itself. What are those kind of key challenges? Um, oftentimes when we talk to customers, we kind of have to re-baseline and come to that realization that OpenStack is not a product, right? It is a collection of loosely coupled open source projects. My best analogy is like, imagine this amazing sea of Legos that they can all be snapped together and you can choose different Legos and put them together in different combinations to make what your open stack cloud looks like. But holy cow, it's immensely complex. If you look at Nova alone, right? There are eight different virtualization drivers, depending on my platform and what I want to use. There are over 700 unique configurable attributes of just the compute service. Now I multiply that across all of the different projects that I can include as part of my private cloud and all the different permutations and external drivers and components that go into it it can be a little overwhelming. One of the things that we see is that the market itself, the cloud market is continuing to evolve. And it's out of this complexity and this barrier to entry that we see opportunity to help customers kind of get through this process. Um, I talk about how massively complex it is. For many organizations, they can certainly try to take that challenge on themselves. But there are many others that are looking for maybe a managed experience that kind of goes through that. To build on my Lego analogy, there's this context of, I could build my own car. I can source the parts myself. I can read manuals. I can figure out how to put this together. Maybe I have that expertise in-house. Maybe that is a core competency for me, and that makes a lot of sense. But for a lot of organizations, maybe it doesn't. And this is really just those, those cloud components that we talk about. How can I solve that and give you the easy button, the OnStar experience, where I have somebody else kind of paving that way? Like I talk about the complexities and barriers to adoption within broader OpenStack, kind of across all these projects, it's that OpenStack is hard, it's very complex, there's a scarcity of talent up there, but there's a whole underlying component of complexity around networking specifically that creates a huge challenge for enterprises to adopt it. Yeah, and you know, to dig deeper on the network side, um, one of the things that I hear from the users I work with, and I've been part of the OpenStack community for a very you know, large number of years, um, is, you know, is that they sometimes you know, see the networking as a barrier to the adoption of a cloud solution versus an enabler, which is what it should really be, right? Um, and you know, part of this is you know, something that you know, Brian also hinted at, which is the organizational challenges that they face internally of not being able to adjust to the models of operating um, you know, all the different components, obviously including the network, where everything tends to be more automated, on-demand, streamlined, uh, versus the more traditional model of, okay, I need you know, some network functionality, I'm going to open a ticket, I'm going to wait for someone to go and you know, provision this network component for me and make it available so that my end user application can then go and consume it. Um, and so, you know, by talking again to users, this is an example of a real customer that we were working with, which is, you know, they were opening uh, a very large number of tickets every time they needed to bring up an environment for an application. Um, you know, 78 tickets, it's a huge number. And it was taking them, you know, a certain number of months to be able to bring up this environment. And they're certainly not the only one out there. And so their goal clearly is to see how they can take this impediment and make it an enabler 
where they can you know, not only achieve you know, compute on demand and storage on demand, but also make the networking component uh, fully programmable uh, and fully you know, able to be created in a matter of a few seconds. Um, now, you know, probably you are, you know, most of you are familiar with the networking project within OpenStack that it's aiming at providing networks as a service, which is Neutron. Um, you know, just for those of you that are just approaching the OpenStack space, uh, Neutron was a project that was introduced a little after the creation of OpenStack. It was introduced with the Folsom release. And the main goal for Neutron was from the get-go to enable uh, two um, personas, the cloud operator as well as the tenant, to both have the ability to create networks as a service. Um, you know, before Neutron, there was some very basic networking functionality that was kind of baked into overall OpenStack within Nova. Uh, but that lacked the control uh, in terms of features and functionalities and configurations and more advanced uh, applications needed. And especially as we start moving OpenStack into enterprise territory, um, you want to be able to not just deploy new cloud applications, but also take existing applications and move them into this cloud environment. So obviously, the network plays a key, comp uh, plays a key role there, right? Where you want to be able to give control to the user of the cloud, where they can go and create their networks, their routing, their IP space, their security policies, and also make sure that the cloud operator can still enforce any type of common rule and services across the different tenant environments. Um, so a lot of progress has been made, obviously, in the OpenStack or community around the networking piece, but um, if you were here for this past four days and you signed in some of the networking related sessions, there's certainly a lot of challenges that are still there and still present. And, and some of these reside around kind of the architectural choices that were made at the beginning of you know, the design phase of the networking component. And some of these come from trying to match um, some of those design decisions with the large scale and the production requirements of you know, customers and users in the OpenStack community. Um, you know, you, you probably are familiar with the fact that there is uh, a mixed bag of distributed functionalities and centralized functionalities and some constructs of high availability that can be you know, matched to some of the components down there. But it's not necessarily the most homogeneous design. So one of the things that you know, we see when we work with users that are approaching OpenStack, and especially from an enterprise perspective, is to help them you know, map the traditional constructs of networking and the solutions that are used to build to this you know, new model that is certainly you know, more distributed, more software-based. And as Brandon was mentioning, there is, you know, on the networking side as well, there is a very large number of choices and options that users can go through. Um, so what we're going to go through next is you know, to show you how we jointly bring a solution to our users that helps simplify some of these you know, architectural choices as well as organizational boundaries um, and you know, speed up the adoption of a technology like OpenStack and enable them to consume more advanced functions like network as a service within their solution. race for the click. <laughs> Sorry. So to start with kind of setting the theme for this, and this has really been, from a Rackspace perspective, our mantra around how do we solve this for customers, it's really we're making OpenStack simple. How do we make this where you can consume OpenStack as opposed to being worried about operating it? How do we deliver it to you in a way with a reliable and predictable um, scale and feature and performance and availability that you can then spend your efforts innovating on top of? How do you consume these services as opposed to trying to build them yourself or manage them yourself? So it's really trying to deliver that as a fully managed service. The way we do that, and part of that key value proposition of our partnership with PlumGrid, being able to bring together our operational expertise and the capabilities of the PlumGrid ONS platform, is really around how do we provide you that single point of contact for all of your OpenStack operations? There's no longer this I'm going to call a vendor X for this and vendor Y for this and troubleshoot this and look up in Google for this. How do we solve that for you? How do we simplify that and allow you to consume it and spend your efforts innovating on top of OpenStack rather than trying to operate it? We have a tight integration with the PlumGrid ONS service. So this isn't just a logo on a slide. Our teams work together. The PlumGrid team makes the upstream contributions into the OpenStack Ansible project that we use to consume and deploy our prescribed deployments and build out and operate private clouds. We work with them very closely on a constant testing, validation, and certification process so that we know with each release of the Rackspace private cloud 
and with the ONS platform, these are working tightly together and working in a predictable, scalable, repeatable fashion. We have an, a massive amount of expertise between our two organizations. Rackspace, of course, as that foremost operator of OpenStack technologies between our public cloud and obviously the number of private clouds that we continue to build out and operate for our customers, and then bring in the in-depth expertise that the PlumGrid team brings as part of that cohesive solution for our customers. We're able to really meet those needs. And then that one support number. Again, it's not a decoupled experience. As customers are operating this, as they're working through these challenges, there's one number to call, and we as a collective team are responding to that, both with the same focus on delivering customer outcomes. Um, it's not, again, a decoupled experience. It's very important to our overall relationship. Um, so Brian spoke a little bit about you know, the business value, and certainly this is you know, one of the major drivers. It was one of the major drivers for us as two companies to come together and bring to the OpenStack community a joint solution uh, that it's tightly integrated. But uh, you know, obviously, there's also a lot of you know, interesting technical reasons that you know, play a very important role to our users as they go through the selection process and you know, the decision process on how to go about adopting OpenStack. Um, you know, so just to kind of help you um, get, get some ideas and navigate maybe your decision here, um, you know, I wanted to highlight a little more the technical aspect of, of the integration. Um, so Brian mentioned you know, Ansible, and you know, obviously, this plays a critical role in how easy it is for someone to get a deployment up and running, right? So the fact that you have these two solutions being fully automated through the same framework, you know, really helps someone to get started in a matter of, you know, a few hours. Now, let's be realistic, it's probably not gonna be minutes, but it's gonna be a matter of a few hours as long as your physical infrastructure is in place. The two components can quickly come together. Um, and this is something that it's quite important. I know how many of you have tried deploying OpenStack. I tried, you know, I've been trying since Folsom, Grizzly, Ivan, and all of that, and certainly it's been getting easier and easier and easier. But it's still, you know, if, especially if you, if you are in an enterprise environment and used to enterprise-grade solutions, uh, it's, it's not necessarily something that's always there. So we, you know, collectively put a lot of effort around making the deployment model and automation as simple and seamless as possible so that you can, you know, be up and running in, you know, very little time. And the fact that we bring the teams there to help you through the process should, you know, hopefully speed up the, the whole, uh, the whole, you know, again, deployment um, time. Uh, the second aspect is, you know, what we refer to as an enterprise grade um, architecture. And uh, there's two primary components there that I want to highlight. Uh, the first one is the concept of high availability. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time educating customers as a product evangelist around OpenStack, OpenStack networking, and you know, what are some of the architectural decisions that they have to make from the get-go. And you know, very often someone asks me, can I start with just you know, kind of trunk, default, OpenStack? And my answer is always, sure, go for it. You know, anything that you pick out there is going to work for a small deployment. Now, it's a very different discussion when you start looking at what's going to happen when you want to run a production workload on top of that environment. Um, and that's where you know, the architectural decision of looking for something that provides a very strong high availability model, and this is true both for the overall you know, OpenStack framework, and in particular for what concerns me, the networking layer, right? which, is, which is what provides the you know, underlying connectivity between workloads and storage and all the components that you have in the environment, uh, it's of paramount importance. Right? If you cannot tolerate a failure, um, if you know, there's any component that it's hard to make you know, uh, highly available, that can be an impediment to you know, successfully rolling out a new business. So you know, from an enterprise grade architecture perspective, having a strong, high available, uh, strongly high available solution is something that is very critical. Uh, the second aspect of things kind of goes back to what I was mentioning, which is if you have five nodes, anything will do, right? But if you start looking at you know, kind of the typical size of a cell, which is maybe you know, 250 nodes to 500, and then you want to start looking at a multi-cell solution, you certainly need to start selecting solutions there that can scale to those numbers, um, can you know, seamlessly scale to those numbers that are not going to just fall apart because you want to add more compute power to it. Um, and so you know, what we do jointly is to make sure that we you know, harden the code, obviously, to make it enterprise grade, but also to look at these key architectural uh, components and make sure that they're tightly integrating the solution built in so that when it comes to you as a user, you get those benefits. 
Uh, the third aspect, which is critical for an enterprise environment, is the you know, security framework, right? And uh, there's a lot to it, and I'm not going to have the time to go through all the aspects of this. But the first aspect is obviously that you're most likely building a multi-tenant solution. If you were to have just a single tenant solution, you probably wouldn't be looking at OpenStack and all that comes with it, right? So by definition, whenever you have multiple tenants that are sharing the same infrastructure, you want to be able to have a common shared infrastructure so you can get the best from a you know, utilization and cost perspective and um, you know, operational cost perspective as well. But you want to make sure to you know, be able to tightly isolate workloads that belong to different applications or different users or different line of businesses. Um, and you, you, know, you want to be able to apply security, strict security policies right at the boundary of each of those tenant environments. And so that's something that you know, we jointly bring to the table. And you know, especially from a networking perspective, one of the key tenants of our solution is to provide a strong you know, micro-segmentation and multi-tenancy solution. Uh, the other aspect of you know, being an enterprise and deploying OpenStack is to be able to audit this environment, have all the logs you need to be compliant to whatever compliance you have in your environment, right? So that's something that you know, we keep as one of the key requirements for, for the deployments we enable. Um, the last uh, bullet for, you know, it's really important, and, and we're gonna talk a lot more about you know, how we enable users to build their business on top of, of this kind of joint platform, right? But the whole idea is that uh, you know, we want to speed up your you know, rolling out a new business. And this is the number one driver most, you know, most often for you to go and look at OpenStack, right? You wanna bring your business, you wanna roll it out faster, um, you wanna generate more revenue. And there's all sort of impediment to this. The first one is, you know, we obviously want to bring you the greatest and latest features as fast as we possibly could, right? So this is one of the you know, key uh, enablers for, for you to, to bring more value to your line of business. Uh, we also want to make it very simple to you know, upgrade and migrate from one existing environment to, to another environment. Um, we want to make sure that we can help you bridge anything that is pre-existing into this new cloud deployment that you have, and we want to help you design applications on top of this. So we'll talk a little more about kind of the design phase of a project for us, but that's where we can help you take an application and figure out exactly how um, you, know, you map the requirements of this, maybe traditional enterprise application, and port it to a cloud environment. So there's clearly a lot more details there. Uh, you know, customers ask me you know, to things like load balances as a service, and uh, you know, micro segmentation, all sort of things that we can do for them technically in this environment. But um, you know, I just kind of wanted to give you kind of four key points from a technical perspective that you can bring home together with the four business values that Brian identified earlier um, to kind of look at the, you know, the overall value of this joint solution. All right, so if we start to talk about kind of the collective offerings that we're providing, um, I touched on this from a OpenStack private cloud practice area within Rackspace, and our focus, again, is how do we simplify the way in which you can consume OpenStack? Going back to those two big barriers to adoption, just general, based on the user survey and, and other analyst feedback, is the complexity of OpenStack and certainly the networking layer, and then that lack of talent that's out there. We really focus on this delivering OpenStack as a service, if you want to think of it in that context, but it's really delivering it as a fully managed service offering. Um, we focus on uh, delivering a high available, reliable platform. We actually stand behind the availability of the OpenStack APIs with a 4.9's SLA. Um, that is our focus on being able to operate it as part of a scalable, highly available control plane as part of our reference architecture and the way in which we deploy and manage those services. We take this practice anywhere our customers need to be. We have the ability to deploy and operate private clouds in any of our data centers, in any of our customer facilities or third-party data centers. And we even recently announced the ability to actually provide hardware uh, into third-party facilities as well. So for customers that are looking for that fully managed experience from the floor tiles to the top of rack switches, we can now provide those services, again, based on that operating expertise and the way in which we deliver these services. That comes from Rackspace's DNA and our involvement in OpenStack since the beginning. We have more operational expertise operating, not just deploying, operating OpenStack clouds, both private and public, than anybody else in this space by multiple factors, a factor of many, if you will. 
And then looking at this single platform context, how do I deliver you a mechanism that you can deploy virtualized workloads, bare metal capabilities, cloud or uh, container technologies, all as part of that service. That's really the cloud vision and what we're trying to enable our customers so that again, by delivering it to you as a managed service, you can focus your efforts and in, in innovation on top of those clouds um, as opposed to trying to figure out how to run them. If we look at just a quick touch base on what our technology offering is within the OpenStack private cloud area, um, we recently released our Liberty series, if you will, or the first of that Liberty series of our RPC product. This is a prescribed deployment of OpenStack. We kind of opened our segment as we're talking about the Lego design and all these different pieces of, of OpenStack. That goes to the overall breadth of the projects within OpenStack. Not all projects are created equally. Many are in different stages of maturity and, and forming and how they grow and where are the sharp edges. We actually work very closely with our customers to make sure that we are deploying those components of OpenStack that are very mature, that we can stand behind and operate with that high availability SLA that we stand behind, and where we've developed that operational experience that we can operate that uh, confidently for our customers. This sphere of projects and capabilities and features does continue to expand with each release as we continue to be very active in contributing upstream to OpenStack and then pulling in the benefits of that to our customers as we can continue to mature and advance these different projects. But we are very prescriptive as to how we deploy those. The same is true on the networking side of things. Um, we've been very deliberate in our partnership with PlumGrid, identifying somebody that can bring to the table those advanced SDN capabilities to meet those security use cases. Um, I can't say it as fast or as elegantly as she does, but the concept of micro-segmentation and multi-tenancy, say that five times fast, I dare you. Um, these are the capabilities that this partnership can bring to us so we can deliver that full comprehensive solution to our customers and do so again in a confident, highly available, highly reliable way. You wanna talk about? Yeah, so this is what PlumGrid brings to the table. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we are an SDN solution and we have, um, you know, it's, we are software only, we have an overlay based model. And what we do is we bring a very comprehensive networking offering to uh, you know, to our joint partnership with, with Rackspace. Um, there's a few, you know, key functionality that we bring to the table here that I, you know, want to highlight for, for the audience. And, you know, the, the first one is obviously the fact that, you know, we bring the ability to the end user to create very rich virtual networks. And this is not true just for the end user, it's true also for the cloud operator. Uh, there certainly is some, you know, uh, some functionality that are exposed through OpenStack networking, but we'll give some ideas later of some of the even more advanced use cases that might not be, you know, something that you can map as is to the OpenStack abstractions that we can satisfy with with this platform here. Um, the other aspect of this is obviously what I was mentioning earlier around security. Um, and so one of the key functionality that we bring to the table is the ability to you know, have these micro-segmented environments. Um, I don't have time to explain you know, how it exactly works, but we have this concept of virtual domains, which are like you know, little bubbles that you can associate to a user or an application. And within these virtual domains, you can first of all define kind of security policies right at the boundaries of the virtual domain. And you also have the ability to define any type of you know, arbitrary network functionality that an application or a user wants to consume within it. Um, this coupled with the fact that we have a very unique data plane technology, which is open source and it's called IOVisor, that lives inside each and every compute node, gives us the ability to bring this very advanced networking offering coupled with analytics and visibility inside the compute layer without the need for any agent or central component like network nodes that really come in the way of scale out and high availability and all the things that we were discussing earlier. Um, the other thing that we bring to the table is the fact that, again, thanks to this distributed model that we have, uh, we have a lot of understanding of what happens in the environment. Uh, we can kind of monitor you know, everything, all the workloads, their interaction with the network, and expose this information uh, centrally so that you can then act upon it and operationalize your environment. And that's obviously something that jointly it's really important for us when we enable a user to not only deploy something and then be like, oh, bye bye, have fun with that, right? But you know, to you know, continue throughout the entire life cycle of, of a cloud project. Um, so key you know, operational tools that help you 
uh, monitor and troubleshoot and proactively find issues at the network layer are something that we have put into, you know, into the product solution. And you know, the last thing that I want to you know, mention is the kind of scalable architecture. And I'll show you what it looks like in a, in a picture here, which is the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, we don't need to have agents or central components. Which one is still? I like this one. I got it. Uh, uh, yeah, I got it. So what we have here is uh, we have this distributed component that lives inside each of, our, of the compute nodes in an OpenStack deployment, and that's built on you know, IOVisor, as I mentioned earlier. And this is how we bring all the features and functionality. So as I was mentioning earlier, um, this is a key um, architectural principle that will help you scale from five nodes to 50 nodes to you know, 500 nodes in a very seamless way. And you know, that coupled with you know, the visibility that we bring to the table and all the operational tools really help you with you know, not just building a small initial environment, but you know, scaling out and rolling all type of interesting applications on top of this. Um, so this is you know, what, the, what it looks like you know, um, behind the curtains, right? And we didn't want to just be like, oh, trust us, this is how the platform kind of comes together, right? We wanted to give you an idea of you know, the moving parts. Um, but what we want to do next uh, is, you know, after we took you to the, tr to the challenges and we took you through the value of the joint solution and how it works behind the covers, is to actually show you how we, you know, in a very concrete and practical way, help a user uh, through the journey of adopting uh, an open stack environment. So how do we help someone build a private cloud, right? And what are some of the steps that we, you know, together go through? And, you know, I just want to highlight um, something here because it's really important. Um, you might think that a lot of the challenges that an organization encounters in adopting OpenStack are technical challenges. And while that's perfectly true, there's also a whole lot that has to do with the internal, you know, organization structure and readiness to consume new technology and products. Um, and this is true from, you know, the engineering group that, you know, necessarily might not be able to build a new solution from scratch all the way to the operational team that might not be able to uh, be proficient from day zero in operating this such environment, right? Um, and, and I'm a technologist, I'm really passionate about everything that's new and you know, can change and transform the world, but I'm also um, you know, very much aware of the you know, barrier to adoption of new technologies, right? How long it takes to learn, to unlearn, for example, how to do traditional networking and learn how to do software and FI networks, and you know, unlearn how to do traditional, uh, you know, compute management, and learn how to do, you know, how to provision compute uh, on demand through OpenStack, right? Um, so what we want to show you here is how, through a series of steps, we can help organizations start get started on their journey to private clouds, right? So, yeah, I, I think to build on that, I think one of the key themes that we see are why do OpenStack projects or initiatives fail? There's certainly the early stage of, we failed to get it up and running. There's certainly the, I failed to operate it at scale. I couldn't upgrade it, I couldn't keep it running. But oftentimes, even if you can get through those two barriers, as Valentina mentioned, there's the organizational adoption of it. In many cases, this is a brand new technology. I have to teach these people how to consume these services in order for them to really get value out of it. Like, what's the ROI on me building this cloud if nobody's gonna be able to use it? So it really is a journey. It isn't a turnkey, here I've built this amazing snowflake cloud for you, go on your way. There's a bigger part to that. Uh, between our two organizations, again, with that joint focus on the customer outcome, we believe there's a number of steps along that way. We invest upfront in helping and walking through our customer, or walking our customers through um, a very involved design and discovery session. How do we help to understand and profile your use cases, the workloads that you'll be running on this? And oftentimes customers don't know what that is. That's fine, we can help model for general ones, but how do we start with those informed decisions around sizing and how will this grow and how will this scale? How do we make sure that we're setting you up to be successful with that cloud early on? That then can roll into the initial deployment, but it, it can't stop there. You then need to go into, from a training perspective, how do we enable the different personas within your organization that need to understand how to use this technology to be successful? Obviously focusing on the cloud user, those developers and, and others that will be consuming these cloud resources, how do you make it easy for them to do so? How do you help make them effective in doing so so that you actually start to get usage on this right away? How do you help train an operator capability 
so that those key architects and others within your organization that need to understand how OpenStack works can have that appropriate baseline of, of functionality and capability. And as you start to look at the more advanced capabilities that you can leverage from the SDN layer, how do I start to be able to consume these services and architect applications and how I'm going to roll out these different workloads to take advantage of the security capabilities and scalability capabilities, all the things that I want to add to my way in which I'm going to consume these clouds. That becomes a very important part of that journey and that experience to continue to build on that. We have within Rackspace, as I thump my microphone, um, as well as with our partnership, we have the ability to bring in additional services to help customers as they get up and running in this cloud. How do I start to focus on those things on top of the cloud, our enablement services group? How do you think about re-architecting applications or moving? Um, there was a great keynote earlier, I think Jonathan kind of talked about this classification of applications or workloads that people are moving to OpenStack. You have that cloud-hosted experience. How am I forklifting or trying to move across? What are the design considerations I need to do? to move those pets and make them successful in an OpenStack world. I have the cloud optimized. What are the tooling and automation and other things that I can start to take advantage of within an OpenStack platform to help me advance those applications and make them more effective? And then of course, how do I start to architect for the true cloud native type of stateless, horizontally scalable applications? Bringing those resources to help customers make those transitions, learn and embrace these technologies is a key part of making them successful. But again, it can't stop there. The ongoing operational experience is another key part to making these customers successful. It's not enough just to install a cloud once. How are you scaling it? How are you upgrading it? How are you managing it? Um, you're gonna design self-healing applications that take advantage of the APIs and the elasticity of a cloud, but if the cloud itself isn't there, it doesn't matter. So there's a heavy focus on that, that operational experience, which goes back to the constant testing, validation, and certification that we do jointly to make sure that collectively we can provide that highly available cloud that doesn't just meet your needs today, but we continue to grow with you and scale with you and make sure that the lights are on and things are running as you expect it in a predictable way. Yeah, and just to give you an idea of, um, you know, one of the results of this kind of joint design, we wanted to, you know, give you something that would be very tangible, is one of the first steps that we do, you know, together with our customers is to come up with kind of two designs. One is more of a logical design, and that means that we take your applications and we start looking at, you know, at your specific use cases, and I'll give you some ideas later on what some of those are, um, and, you know, come up with, okay, what does the virtual network look like? what type of advanced applications and functionalities do I need there. Um, but the other one, it's also to come up with what does your environment, your physical environment look like? And this might seem like a trivial step, but it's actually something that it's quite important to help, um, again, getting started in adopting these technologies. So one of the components of what we usually you know, bring to the table is you know, some very detailed uh, reference architectures around the deployment model. And you know, we try to, um, as much as we possibly can, come together to standardize on you know, how you go about deploying this solution and you know, bring you something that it's you know, a validated design that you can follow and you know, leverage in your environment that includes kind of the basic functionality as well as some of the advanced use cases that you might have in mind for your specific environment. Um, so it's not just a matter of obviously bringing together two products, but it's you know, kind of coming up with the entire set of uh, tools that are needed to you know, get started with a real production deployment. Um, so kind of to wrap it all together, and then I want to certainly leave a little time for Q&A here. Um, you know, we wanted to show you um, the kind of so what. So now you talked about all these you know, great solutions and soft, you know, offerings and services, but um, I'm getting started in my journey. What can I do with this? So we wanted to you know, get you thinking and get some thoughts going there and show you some of the use cases that we see around um, you know, the concept of cloud in general, right? And this can be, you know, your private cloud environment. It can be, you know, more hybrid offerings that you're building. But, um, you know, we kind of wanted to give you some ideas of what are our users looking at, you know, private cloud for. And, you know, obviously there is the traditional infrastructure as a service, which I haven't even quite mentioned there, which is simply the ability to start creating these, you know, environments and, you know, provision the 
self-service, on-demand control to the end user. But there's all sort of interesting applications, um, PaaS being one of those, that uh, you know, are being commonly deployed within OpenStack and private cloud environments, which are certainly driving some of the advanced requirements uh, you know, from an underlying platform perspective that we went through earlier on in the flow. Um, other very good use case that we see from joint customers is the e-commerce use case, where we have um, you know, businesses that are driving uh, revenue through a website, right? Where I go and can you know, purchase something. And you know, they're actually bringing in all sort of interesting requirements, obviously of scale, uh, obviously of security, right? I'm making a transaction with my credit card, so I need to make sure that the environment is isolated and it's auditable and all the things that I'm expecting from, uh, from an online platform. Um, another great example is you know, companies that are looking at uh, streamlining functions like communication, communication as a service, moving from you know, provisioning of physical equipment to provisioning something that can be consumed as a software model. Um, there's obviously a lot more that can be built on top of this environment, right? And by no means this is an exhaustive list, but we wanted to, you know, kind of wrap it up and show you some of the potential use cases that you can start thinking about once you have a ready uh, to deploy managed solution for your private cloud environment. Um, and I think with this, we wanted to thank you for coming here and open the floor for any question or comment or additional. Thoughts. We do have a few moments and there are microphones out. If anybody has any yeah. questions, we'd be happy to answer them. All right, thanks for coming. Thank you. Oh, you have a question, please. Can you answer a question on RPC? Sure. Um, I saw the components that you deploy with RPC 12. How are you deploying uh, Swift? Are you doing it on the controllers or can you also have it deployed on an HA proxy and separate? Sure, yeah, so um, we kind of advanced through it and I, I didn't show kind of our full reference architecture, but within RPC, which is our affection name for Rackspace Private Cloud, we actually deploy all of the OpenStack services in LXC containers on a control plane. Our starting position is a four node control plane that run all the OpenStack services. With Swift, depending on the size or scale of the Swift cluster, this is where that modular capability of deploying those services in the containers can help us scale out to be very large. We can run the Swift proxy services in containers on the existing control plane, or depending on the size or scale of that environment for a very large Swift cluster, typically we will add additional infrastructure nodes and dedicate uh, to the Swift proxy service. So it's really just tuning for what are the expected input output type of workload and the scale that you're running. Right. But it's part of that control plane. We can scale it as big as we need it to be. Right, because I'm interested in having Swift on its own. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, for performance, oftentimes we will break out the Swift proxy services onto so dedicated nodes. LXC. You need to repeat that. Correct. Yeah, we deployed the Swift proxy services into LXC containers. Oh, Can you just come to the mic, sorry? Otherwise, it's not going to be in the recording. Oh, true. <laughs> I'm failing to restate the question. Did, did version uh, uh, let RPC 11, did it use LXC containers? Uh, we've been using the LXC container as our deployment methodology since our Icehouse release, RPC v9. Okay. And do you have, uh, are you working on Mataka right now? And do you have any idea when you might release? I do, yes, <laughs> and yes. So um, we obviously, there's a component that comes to our release schedule, right? Um, which is tied to as we can enable our support teams and kind of fully deliver that solution, as we can continue the integration and certification of our partner plugins, such as the Plum Grid, that, that kind of leads into that. Um, our team, we recently announced our Liberty series that we released. It came later in the calendar than we would have ideally done so, but we've been working on a lot of other things as well. Going forward with our Mataka release, and then as we get into a regular cadence following the community going forward, will come much quicker. So the Mataka series, or V13, will be coming later this summer, um, but you'll see us close the gap a little bit to where we've been, as we also want to stay very close to the community from an overall uh, vulnerabilities, uh, support, and, and work that comes from that. One more question, please. If you can use the mic, if you don't mind. Thank you. So currently we use uh, both Rackspace public cloud and private cloud. So do you have any reference architectures spanning both these two with OpenStack? Ah, so um, it's a good scenario. So again, to kind of restate the 
the uh, hybrid experience, if I'm kind of maybe jumping ahead to look for, of something that's consuming both private cloud and public cloud capabilities. Um, so from a connectivity perspective, Rackspace has a suite of products that allow you, if you're running a private cloud within our data centers, to connect and extend to our public cloud we call Rack Connect. Um, we are, as an engineering team, to kind of give you a little bit uh, look underneath the covers within Rackspace, we've actually brought our, pri our private and public cloud engineering teams together that are now very focused on a lot of pure upstream development and how we actually bring those platforms even closer together. So beyond the, I have common API frameworks and there's certainly orchestration and tooling that I can leverage across both. So we've helped customers with kind of cloud bursting scenarios and I don't mean the meteorological term, actual workload kind of bursting. Um, but you'll see over time as we bring these platforms even closer and closer together. Our public cloud has kind of been an area where we can continue to advance and innovate and our private cloud where we've been bringing in those hardened services that we can operate at scale for production workloads, you'll see those start to come even closer and closer together. All Other right. questions? Are we standing between you guys and beer? <laughs> uh, the question is, are we the only company operating a public open stack cloud? I don't believe that's true. I believe there are several. Um, I think even the keynote, and I'm going to fail to mention the names because I don't remember, but there are a handful now. Other questions? Great. Well, Valentin and I will certainly be around if anybody else has any one-on-one -on -one questions, but we certainly appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.